This is the big story segment on the AM show. But right before we get into our stories this morning, I want to remind you that this year's CompuGhana cashback has been named as prime cashback season. And it's packed with incredible deals and exciting surprises. Now, this prime cashback, CompuGhana, is bringing you exclusive discounts, prime savings, and awesome surprises when you shop products from any of the branches nationwide. You can find products from your favorite brands like Samsung, LG, TCL, HP, Lenovo, Dell, Media, Nasco, Techno, Infinix, Itel, Huawei, and many more. Visit any of CompuGhana branches nationwide and enjoy exclusive discounts on all products. You know that CompuGhana has a wide range of IT-related products like mobile phones and electronic products such as laptops, printers, desktops, tablets, televisions, fridges, home theaters, air conditioners, gas cookers, and more. And what's more amazing this year is that this year's prime cashback with CompuGhana has got great prices and instant gifts in cash prices for your shopping experience. So anytime you shop at CompuGhana this season, be on the lookout for the surprise team. Answer a question correctly and win instant cash and gifts. You deserve this opportunity too. So rush to CompuGhana now. The promo runs till, from now till December. So visit CompuGhana.com or simply call 302 752 for more information. Ben will tell you more. Well, even as we talk about all of this, you know your health is your wealth. And that's why I'd like to introduce to you Medicast Hospital, a modern healthcare facility built with your recovery in mind. They have spacious wards built with your family in mind, a warm and caring pediatric unit built with your children in mind. And to top it off, they've assembled some of the brightest minds in medicine led by Dr. Yao Safo, the drive time doctor, to serve you. But that's not all. There's still more. They offer general medical services as well as specialist services in the following areas. Plastic surgery, obstetrics, gynecology, child health, urology, psychiatry, and eye care. Additionally, they also offer a comprehensive medical diagnostic service encompassing endoscopy, medical laboratory services, x-rays, and scans. And if you're trying to get premium medicine to help your recovery, they have a 24-hour pharmacy ensuring you always receive efficacious, safe, and affordable medicine. And they are bringing to you something that we all need, the most powerful medicine of all, simple human kindness and empathy. They take pride in holding themselves to the highest attainable standards, and they accept all forms of payment as well, including from private health insurance companies. Locate Medicast Hospital at number 10 Kinso Street near the Ashale Boche uh, School Junction. You can reach them on 0501 477 340. That is 0501 477 340. On social media, they are at Medicast GH. Medicast Hospital, a place of healing. Well, we are your election headquarters. The National Democratic Congress at a press conference on Tuesday raised some concerns bothering on a number of issues in relation to the 2024 general elections. Key amongst them is the fear of a plot to rig the elections. Communications officer of the party, Sami Jemfi, alleges that the NPP has employed the services of a military official to help them rig the election. Take charge of a well-crafted scheme that has been designed by the NPP to rig the upcoming elections, particularly in the Ashanti region. Through ballot staffing, swapping of ballot boxes, swapping of pink sheets, and other clandestine activities, starting with a special voting exercise scheduled for December 2nd of this year. Although he failed to provide evidence to this when he was pushed by the media, he said the party has enough intelligence in its possession to back the claim. He adds that they will, in the coming days, petition the Inspector General of Police to investigate the matter. We will be petitioning the IGP because he's the chairman of the Election Security Tax Force. And we will also be drawing the attention of the CDS to these developments officially. But not just him, our external developmental partners will also be notified. And so the observers will be notified. The foreign missions will be notified. 
But communications director of the new patriotic party, Richard Ahiagba, has refuted the allegations, insisting no military official has been employed to rig the elections in favor of the MPP. Well, the specific answer to your question is no. Uh, he is not working with a new patriotic party. He's not part of our campaign. And, and so, therefore, uh, we have not contracted him to do any such job that the NDC is crying about. On the safety of citizens during the elections, the NDC says the IGP and the Ghana Police Service must ensure that no life is lost in the process. Elections are about counting hairs and not cutting hairs. No single person in Ghana must lose their life because of an election. Because this is about the people's free will to decide for themselves those they deem fit to lead them. The IGP owes a duty to the people of Ghana to be fair and fair-minded to ensure peace during and after the December 7th elections. In this regard, we in the NDC assure him of our fullest cooperation. The party is hopeful that their concerns will be addressed ahead of the elections. James Savage's report for Joy News. So what are we talking about? The NDC has alleged a grand scheme to rig the 2024 elections and is calling for the media removal of Brigadier General Michael Lopoku, the general officer of the Central Command, whom they say supervised the Ayawaso brutality years ago and has a notorious record and becoming of his profession. We'll delve into this, but also the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers, that's Kodil, have raised concerns over instances of vote buying in the Ashanti, Savannah and Western regions in the second report from its observation of the pre-election environment ahead of the December 7th election, that is the presidential and parliamentary election. How concerned should we be in our efforts to secure credibility of the elections? You want to stay with us. Ben will bring in our guest and the conversation will start. Well, welcome aboard. Of course, we are your election headquarters and we're delving into those critical issues. Joining us uh, via Zoom, we have Dr. John Osai Kwapong. He is a CDD fellow. We also have Dr. Kwesi Amache Boateng, a political scientist at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Doc and Doc, good morning. Good morning to you, Ben. Good morning to Sweetie as well. Can good he... morning to you. Good morning to and you. Good morning, Doc. Right. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> right. Let's, let's look at these two issues, starting with uh, some of the claims that have been made. But let's start with the Cordeo um, report, that release so far, and some of what it has revealed. It makes for very interesting reading, and we'll be projecting some of them so that you react to them. But what are your initial thoughts on Cordeo and some of the revelations that have come through, from incumbency, advantage, abuse, to vote buying in certain places, and everything in between. I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Amache Mwati. Okay. Um, Thanks for this opportunity. And once again, uh, good morning to your viewers. Actually, Ghana has been, you know, um, experiencing this challenge of incumbency abuse. I do recall that President Kufour uh, accused President Rawlings of same, and yet when he came to office, he had to himself, you know, admit and apologize. Uh, so far, it has not been easy for governments to restrain themselves. But, you see, this is an interesting thing because governments are interested in winning the elections and, 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 and democracy has election as the major engine driving it. And to the extent that they want to, you know, win the elections, over there, it's an issue of self-interest. It's not necessarily a national interest uh, that they are pursuing. So uh, uh, they want to explore all opportunities to do so. And, and, and governments in the Fourth Republic, you know, have not restrained themselves as far as, you know, incumbency abuse is, is concerned. So maybe going forward, is it possible for us to come up with something, you know, some external, uh, uh, if you like, uh, institutional arrangement that can restrain them, that can compel them not to do certain things. Because at least as if we now are, we've allowed them, if you like, uh, to appropriate 
ethics in politics and to you know go through self-restraint they won't do it they want to win the elections they want to win it at all cost and somehow democracies play you know not necessarily that way but in some countries it does play you know along similar uh, fashions i do recall donald trump the last time around year 2020 he wanted to win at all cost and he did you know move in, to, 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 to get his will. So if um, a, a developing country like that, excuse me, developing country like Ghana, you know, suffers a similar issue, I don't think we should be surprised. I don't think we should be surprised, but we need to come up with institutions. And that is the test of a country's ability to run democracy. The challenges that come up, it is up to the relevant uh, polity to come up with institutional arrangement to address those challenges. So I would take it as a challenge confronting Ghana and, and, and it's up to us to do something about it. And we shall dissect these items bit by bit, but I'm taking your initial thoughts. I'll come to you, Dr. Osai Kwapo. Yes, so um, following on the, uh, on the theme that Dr. Amachi mentioned with regards to um, the abuse of incumbency, the one point that I would also add is it presents um, uh, a sort of a tricky dilemma in the sense that on the one hand, uh, government work can't stop, right? Government has to continue uh, functioning. Um, government has to continue spending money um, if there are projects, if there are programs, if there are policies that needs to be rolled out, government has to continue functioning. But on the other hand, it also poses the issue of the timing of certain government actions and whether it is purely a case of ensuring that the wheels are continuing in motion for governance or, or um, whether it is also motivated by uh, politics and securing advantage uh, over your political opponents to project this idea that um, you know, government has really been uh, been doing a lot. And we've been going through that every election uh, uh, cycle um, over the past eight elections that we have, where there's always that accusation of, um, or at least the issue of abuse of incumbency uh, co comes up. If a party is in opposition, um, they, they take the issue of abuse of incumbency very seriously. And then when they are in government, abuse of incumbency is no longer an issue, but it's just simply uh, government uh, continuing to work. And as Doc said, the challenge is how do you put in certain um, institutional arrangement rules that allows you to tame uh, that practice where we can at least have a sense of a fair playing field and move away from uh, this abuse of incumbency issue. All right. Now, you're seeing some slides, I believe, those of you watching, and I'm sure uh, guests as well, if you have a, a second option of watching uh, what we are doing. I just want to run briefly by you some of the thoughts in there as we highlight the conversation. This observation by Cordeo, in terms of a summary of the findings, it points to increased voter education by the Electoral Commission, continuous domination of the MPP, and the NDC as the dominant forces in our uh, elections, different focus on issues by the MPP and the NDC, and generally peaceful political uh, climate, as well as use of state resources for campaign purposes. All of those in uh, there. Then you look at the pre-election uh, observation and campaign activities observed from different uh, fronts. So you look at house-to-house -house engagements, you would realize that you have uh, the NPP, and of course the blue represents the MPP, the green represents uh, the NDC. You would realize that the MPP has, is in the blue and the NDC is in the green. And house-to-house, -house, you have 81% for the MPP, 78% for the NDC. Then in terms of meetings, interactions, maybe face-to-face -face meetings, you have 65% engagement from uh, the NPP's point, and then 70% from the NDC. Rallies, 42% for the MPP, 44% uh, for the NDC. And then party marches, 25% from the MPP, 
20% from the NDC. So it's pretty balanced. I think two, go, two apiece in terms of the leading, but they are pretty close in terms of engagements. You look at the campaign messages. What is the focus of the MPP? Education, agriculture, health. Of course, free SHS would be topical in there. Agric, you've seen the recent talk about uh, silos and everything. Health as well. The NDC is touting the economy, unemployment and corruption. In fact, if you look at the, the points the NDC makes, those are issues that in 2016 were the highlight of the elections. Now, eight years on, the NDC is riding on uh, those. It goes back to the point made by Dr. Amache Boatin that uh, sometimes there's a lot of talk when you're in opposition, but when you are uh, you know, in power, it changes. And that's what we've seen as far as the MPP, what they said then versus what they are focusing on now. But let's, if, if you go to the next slide, you would realize the Kodeo pre-election observation. They've also observed that there's a lot of vote buying going on. 10% of reports received indicated instances of vote buying. And of course, there would be more, but these are what they captured. And where? The question is, where are these things happening? If you go on, you would find out that it's happening predominantly in the Ashanti region, per the Cordillo report, in the Savannah region, and in the Western regions. These are interesting for different reasons, and we'll get into that shortly. Sweetie Abochi. Right. Let me start straight away with Dr. Jonasai Kwapondok. So these reports paint a clear picture. I like that we have a peaceful political climate and that voter education is increasing from the Electoral Commission. But what does this trend reveal about voter priorities and the strength of civic education for these three regions that we are focusing on, Western Savannah and the Ashanti region? What does it tell us? about the voting pattern or the trends in those places? Yeah, so um, especially as it relates to uh, the vote buying mm. um, and why those three regions um, are, are being cited, I suspect that um, in a place like um, Ashanti region, for example, it is, uh, and this is my speculation, that perhaps it is motivated by ensuring that you can get your base out uh, um, to go uh, and vote. In the other two regions, I'm wondering if the, um, the parties involved in this vote buying exercise, if it is because they are picking up intel that um, they promise to be some of the competitive regions uh, where this election is concerned. And that is why you're seeing uh, these incidents of, of vote buying. But the one thing that I would remind the political parties of when it comes to the issue of vote buying is, um, I'll draw the attention to uh, a pre-election survey that CDD did uh, in the 2016 election, where voters were asked about vote buying and what your response should be if you are offered inducements. Mm. And majority said, I'll take the inducement, um, but I'll still vote the the way that i want to mm. i want to vote and so um not that it's a good thing or not that it cannot sway some voters but the cautionary tale there for political parties and those engaged in vote buying is that there's still no guarantee that that inducement that you offer is going to um, ensure that that voter uh, uh, cast their vote for your party because on the day of the election uh, you are not there with the voter when he or she is at the uh, the polling booth ca mm. casting their vote. So it's one thing um, that right. the po political parties would have to keep in mind as they engage in vote buying. Right. Dr. Machi, and this is not new. It's not the first time we're hearing of incidents of vote buying all over the place. But the question is, is it a good campaign strategy or is it a desperate move to get the vote in these th three particular regions, Ashanti, Western and Savannah regions? What do you think, what's your interpretation of what's happening there? Well, first of all, I would like to say that it's a disturbing development because um, Ghana has come far with this democratic practice. And if uh, at this material moment in time, politicians are not able to, you know, uh, beat their chest about the good things they have done, the economy, people's uh, conditions of life improve, improved, but have to go down and, and try to influence voters by offering money and they are taking us back. You know, mm. this practice should be coming down. 
generally it should be coming down uh it, it, it is bordering it, it's a border because uh, it sort of uh, also um undermines the electorate in a way the electorates are if you like a uh, gullible they are terribly poor you give them anything at all they will take it and vote for you to the extent that this practice goes on politicians would not be pushed, you know to focus on developmental agenda that's why you know i'm not surprised about what has happened in recent times, you know, talking, you know, a demonstration that talking is not doing, you know. During this time, the campaigns, they go about and promise heavens in political office. They, they, they simply turn their attention on something else. If their trust is that they can purchase their way through, then our democracy is simply going nowhere. It is indeed a disturbing development. In your opening remarks, you mentioned that we should be looking at or coming up with um, new institutions, something to mitigate this, should I call it a canker? And you say that it is affecting our democracy. Should we actually be looking at prosecuting people who, um, if confirmed, that they're involved in vote buying ahead of elections? We would want to do something like that. But the challenge is that hmm. institutions in Ghana historically have not been able to you know, uh, muster the will to address matters of this nature, especially when it's got to do with government, when it's got to do with political parties, when it's got to do with the state. You know, institutions are not able to see themselves as autonomous, irrespective of the fact that by the constitution, the sitting president might have to appoint some individuals to work in some capacity for the state. But after such appointment, those institutions are supposed to be independent and autonomous, and they are supposed to be guided by, if you like, the norms of the institution. But unfortunately, Ghana has not seen that from the time of independence to date. Mm. People, people sort of uh, simply uh, try to win uh, the sort of a favor of, 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 of the people in power. And so, yes, we might think of coming up with some such institution. My fear is that it won't work. It won't work. We will just be spending another money, expanding the bureaucracy, and if you like, uh, draining the public purse. Right. It might not give us a desired outcome. Then. Well, uh, Dr. Osani Kwapong, I heard you talk about the bit about vote buying, or was it Dr. Amache Boateng? But, but the point to be made is, you, you, you know some of these people talk about the fact that in terms of vote buying, while it is criminal to go into the voting booth and take any photo or even go there with a phone and all of that to snap a shot of what you're doing, some politicians still urge adherents to do that. And we've seen people attempt that. There's also the bit about some people saying that, well, you have to swear when you take my money, swear an oath, and that when you get in there, if you vote contrary to what you took my money for, then, I mean, all these things are in there. So you can't downplay uh, the impact of these, can you? No, you can't. Um, and <laughs> and I, I, I'm not sure the extent to which uh, the laws around uh, vote buying uh, can, can be enforced in the sense that uh, the person taking the inducement um, has to report it, um, and the person offering the inducement, um, you know, you have to find a way to prove that it was an inducement right. designated or designed to skew the voters' um, um, voting decision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Uh, you know, one of the things that the National Commission for Civic Education pointed out, um, especially during the primary season, was that. Years ago, it was something that appeared to be done in secret and in the background, right? So you'd hear about some of these inducements. The hour is that now it seems like it's an open marketplace for buying and selling votes, right? Um, especially during the primaries and what they were uh, they were observing. Um, the, I mean, our best response to it, again, would be if you can enforce the laws around that um, and be able to prosecute people for that. But again, you would have to be able to, you know, um, arrest, get the evidence and prosecute um, folks engaging uh, in that. 
Um, so civic education ends up being another potent tool, uh, continuing to educate you know, citizens that this is not the way to go, educating political parties to restrain themselves from engaging in uh, such activities. But ultimately, I believe that if voters continue the pattern of you can induce me for all you want, but I will vote against you, maybe at some point political parties and candidates would get the message, learn the lesson and stop, stop in offering inducements. I am curious about something that comes up, because if you look at the regions pointed to, even before I go to the segregation of the campaign messages, we're looking at the Ashanti region, the Savannah region, and the Western region. What's interesting about the Ashanti region, and I'm coming to you, Dr. Amachi Bwating, on this one, before I go back to Doc, is that there has been talk about the new patriotic party losing a foothold on the Ashanti region. Not that they will not win the region, uh, the trajectory shows they will, but that they may get lesser votes. And we know that whenever that happens, th the party could suffer great cost. The Savannah region, interestingly, is the region from which the main opponent, John Dramani Mahama, hails. You get yeah. it. Then you have the Western region, another key region for the MPP. What dynamics do you see in there and why uh, this may be popping up in terms of voter inducement? Uh, this is an interesting development because uh, you want to ordinarily argue that, you know, people want to feel safe in the areas that uh, traditionally they have been doing well. But then that is not necessarily what is playing out now. The case of Ashanti region, you know, uh, presents some interesting scenario because um, there, are, there are fears, actually. <laughs> there are fears that just like you said, you know, yes, the MPP might come out, you know, winning the majority of the votes, but they might not necessarily get everything that they need. The problem is the governance and then honoring their uh, promises. You know, Ashanti region, I don't know what happened in government, but Ashanti region was sort of relegated to the background in terms of the sharing of the national key. For a long time, the rules were not fixed. And I remember, you know, uh, the media took up the issue. There was a time when Honorable Kennedy Japan came to Kumasi, went to a particular FM station and blasted MPP for, you know, allowing the rules in Ashanti region to remain the way they are. As we speak, when you enter Kumasi from Accra through a Jusu, and you, 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 you ply down the main road that, you know, brings you to Kumasi, that road is still, you know, the way it is. And just this morning, coming here, I was monitoring the discussions on radio stations. A particular radio station was pointing out, you know, several areas where they think something should be done in the very short run. And interestingly, they mentioned airport one about that there's a, a gully right in the middle of the road just this morning. So the party has a cause, you know, to be jittery. The party has a cause, a, a reason to be, to, to be jittery. And if indeed they are the ones behind this good buying issue, then definitely I will not be uh, 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 surprised. Kumasi market women came out recently complaining that they came speedily surrounded by soldiers and pulled down the structures. They were not even given the time to pack out. And that they promised they were going to speedily put it back. As we speak, it has not been done. They came out openly and they spoke to the party that they will use their time to punish them openly. They said that problem with the economy it affects everybody, you know. So uh, Ashanti region definitely is one of the areas that if you find yourself in a situation of this nature, you want to affect it. The case of Savannah is an interesting thing. I don't know the in rules that, you know, Dr. Bermia has made there for uh, former President Mahama. Once you come from the area, you want, we want to take it for granted mm. that you, you have naturally, normally endeared yourself to the people. They know what you stand for, your values. And so going to the pools, you don't have second thoughts as to who they are voting for. If these are not, you know, uh, I mean, the sense running through the NBC, then once again, it's problematic. It comes from governance. While in office, you know, what, what, what exactly happened? Why is it that the basic needs of the people were not attended to? That of Western region possibly is it, become, you know, a, a place where they are all trying to, 
you know, um, and you know, come out strong and, and, and do better than the other. So these dynamics are playing themselves out the way they are playing themselves out. I think the problem has been governance. Problem has been governance and right. delivering on, 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 on their promises. Okay. Let me put that same question to Dr. Osai Kwapong, especially noting that in the 2020 presidential elections, John Dramani Mahama in the Savannah region where he hails, uh, polled 144,244 votes, accounting for 62.97% of the vote. And Nanado Dankwe Kufuado of the MPP polled 80,605, 80, accounting for 35.19%. Your reflections? Yes, and I would uh, reiterate exactly the things that uh, Dr. Machi has, uh, has pointed out, right, which is when you look at the dynamics in the Ashanti region, um, there's a concern about um, ensuring that the base really turns out. Um, yes, the MPP will win the Ashanti region, but it needs to win the Ashanti region by a certain percentage. And so if these activities are going on, um, my belief is that it is driven by ensuring that uh, they get that minimum level of support uh, in, the, uh, in the region. Uh, in the Savannah region, the other thing you would also notice, not just in the Savannah region, but in the regions in the Northern region, you would notice that um, over time, uh, the NPP has really improved its performance uh, in uh, in those in those regions. And so, again, if you pick Savannah, it's the same dynamic that is playing in Ashanti. In Ashanti, NPP's concern is ensuring the base, making sure that you get a certain level of support. Probably that's the same um, instincts that are driving what is going on in the Savannah region. And then, of course, Western region is a very competitive. Uh, region and so again it's um, how do I ensure that I win one of the competitive regions uh, in this upcoming election. Mm. Sweetie, so yeah. something that I find interesting, I don't know, I'm curious about the MPP's focus in terms of the campaign messaging, education, understandable, agriculture, which has had its own problems, and health, which has also had its own problems. But then interestingly for me, the things that they wrote on to come to power in 2016, the economy, unemployment, corruption. That's what the NDC is. It's, it's what the NDC is now campaigning on. It, it paints an interesting picture, doesn't it? Well, it means that I think that they cannot talk about economy because they are in power. That is why mm. perhaps the former president came under so much scrutiny for saying that Baumia is the one to liberate us. They are in power, so they cannot preach economy. But I want to focus on um, abuse of incumbency, and this is to you, Dr. John Osaipapo. And let me uh, quote this from the report. It says about 11% of observer reports noted the use of public, that is state or local vehicles, for campaigning on behalf of an incumbent candidate. Where do we draw the line? I get that there are some incidents that are clearly abuse of power. For example, putting campaign flyers on drip equipment and the rest. But where do we draw the line? If they are using, um, if they are using state vehicles that they use to campaign, it is theirs to use, is it not? Well, the state vehicles assigned to them have been assigned to them to be used in, the, in whatever official capacity mm. that they are in. So in the US, the way we try to address that issue of separating um, the things that you use official tools of government for and your own campaign activities is this. So for example, let's say when you know a certain president has to travel to a particular state, but as part of that particular state, uh, has to also make a campaign stop. What they do is you fly Air Force One um, and the portion of, the, uh, of, of your flight where you make a campaign stop, mm. the, a cost is calculated and charged to your campaign and you have to reimburse, um, you have to reimburse the state mm. so that you are not you know, using a state resource like Air Force One to be traveling around there. The country so we found a way to address some of these things um, so if you are a government official um, and you are an MP or you want to go and campaign for your party um, and you feel it's 
you know, whatever reason, inconvenient. So you just want to just stick with the same car that you always use. Then the issue is you shouldn't charge that to the state, right? That there has to be a way of saying, okay, you drove from Accra to Kumase to go and campaign for your party using a state vehicle and state fuel. That is not um, going to be catered for by the state and you have to some way, somehow reinvest um, uh, the government for using that kind of resource for um, a campaign activity. Uh, I'm not sure the, how we we'll put in those mechanisms to track that because, again, it would also require that those who do that um, honestly report and are transparent, you know, about it. But um, it's it's worrying, right, that you're using, you know, blatantly using state resources uh, to campaign. It makes the uh, the field uneven. Right. And let me throw that to Dr. Machi. Doc, do we have laws in Ghana preventing incidents like these? And also, I want to hear your thoughts on where we draw the line. Should we be looking at adopting some reforms from the Western world? Okay, on the issue of the laws, it's not that I'm familiar with. It uh, doesn't mean there might not be laws in place as we speak. Mm. And then, uh, looking at the way forward, we might, we might, we might, if you like, uh, adopt something from, you know, the U.S. case that Dr. Kwapon related to. Because uh, my understanding of, you know, Ghana's case is that uh, I think, uh, once again, we expect, uh, I mean, government officials to restrain themselves and to know that, look, I'm attending this program. It's got to do with my party activities. And so I, the moment you do that, you won't get the desired results. You know, once again, you need an external body to check and to, you know, come in strongly to let you know that what you have done. I mean, it amounts to using public resources for personal gain, for party gains. And so going forward, I like to believe that the U.S. model is something that we could adopt here. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's what I see as a, a common sense approach. Because government officials, you know, need their security. The state has a duty to provide that. And if these have already been established and, and confirmed on the ground, their vehicles, the personnel who have to go with them to ensure that, you know, they are safe, while at the same time going about a desired uh, action, campaigning, you know, to you know, maintain political power as part of our democratic work, then we, we, we need to work it out in such ways that... Uh, you know, at least they could reimburse the state, you know, for using state resources when it is established that they are for, you know, party businesses. Thank you so much. We move on to the next topic. Benjamin Asher is in. Well, uh, we're very, very grateful, gentlemen, for having joined uh, the conversation. We had uh, Dr. Kwesi Amache Boateng. But before you go, gentlemen, uh, we'd like you to also consider the case that the NDC is making in respect of uh, the December 7 elections being rigged. We have a representation from both sides uh, who will join us for that discussion. I'll start with you, Dr. Amachi Boateng. What then is your take on everything from General Opoku to what hand he may have from Ayawasu West Wogon to now uh, to Juaboso and plans to rig the election? I'm sure you followed. What are your thoughts on them? I'll start with you, um, Dr. Amachi Boateng. Yeah, generally, Ben, I would say that democracies are difficult to maintain, mm. generally. Democracies over the years have come out as a desired system of government, and you have many countries in the world now practicing democracy than other forms of, uh, uh, you know, governments, and yet, uh, you know, it is, it is a challenge, very, very difficult to maintain. As much as possible, you, you, you need a, a minimum of coercion and, and maximum of consent. And, and this brings in additional issues because uh, it involves essentially competition for power, political power. Here, we have the potential for conflict. And it's an institutionalized conflict, especially when we go into elections. So the issue of a level playing field becomes you know, very important. And, and, state, and state institutions to do where we establish it. Otherwise, the conflict could get out of hand. Only yesterday, we saw attempts by some individuals even to take the life of 
you know, Donald Trump in the United States of America. That is, you know, some level that some of these conflicts, you know, could, could get. Mm. If a political party has a cause to suspect any issue, mm. they, they can't keep quiet. They can't sleep over it. Mm. And, and one challenge that Ghana has had is that we have thrown ethics in politics, you know, to the background, relegated it to the background. There are certain things that states should not do. If, for example, an individual participated in this, uh, I also was one gun thing, and 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 was indicted in one or another way, we got to respect the state's own institutions established and go ahead and implement whatever it is recommendations that were put down. If such people become, you know, uh, I mean, put themselves in a position <clears throat> where they could be promoted, fair enough. But somehow, we put them in. Uh, situations where their very presence can fuel potential conflict, especially during elections, that might be debatable and a very difficult issue to relate to. So then DC definitely has its foot on something. I like to believe. I don't think they are just coming out to, if you like, uh, with, 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 with some propaganda to cause uh, panic and fear in the system. Right. They might have their, they might have their foot on something. Mm. Uh, how are we going to deal with them? I think going forward, all of us will want to be as clear and as transparent as possible, desiring peace. And so whatever it is that we need to put in place now to provide some guarantees that certain things will not happen going into the elections. We've got to do so now. And once again, their desire to appeal to the IGP, to me, it, it, it is good, it is positive. Everybody should be on, on the lookout. It's good that we have a domestic and you know, international election observers who will also be here to participate in everything. Are we going to deviate from our, 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 our pattern? The election take place at a, a, a polling stations. They are counted there with everybody present. Their pink, pink sheets are, are signed and then sent to coalition center. Are we going to deviate from this? Right. If we were to follow this, then you have difficulty in saying that, you know, it's going to be possible for people to bring in already staffed ballot boxes from some place and replacing them. So I think the open nature of our elections itself, you know, it's also going to provide fair right. checks and balances to address some of these issues. Right. Dr. Jonas Aikwapon, that same question to you, but then you listen to the NDC press, they talk about the fact that some of the people that the EC is even using as electoral commission officials have quite an affinity to the MPP, party officials and all of that. What's your response on that? And then we'll let you go. Yeah, thank you very much. So, I mean, if there are, you know, concerns about um, certain individuals uh, with plans to compromise the integrity um, of the election, then certainly uh, these are not issues to be taken lightly and they must be addressed. I think for me, I have two concerns. One is um, in every election year, uh, we tend to have these, um, you know, uh, issues come up about, you know, um, plans to wreck, plans to wreck. Um, and the political parties keep alternating in making these um, assertions and allegations of, um, you know, suspected plans to rig an election, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so again, for me, not to make light of whatever evidence they have or may not have, but I'm just cautioning that uh, this repeated cycle um, would have to find a way to, at some point, break it. The right. other thing, too, is that um, we've built enough transparent safeguard mechanisms into our electoral uh, 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 processes that for me it gives me uh, confidence that uh, it has the ability to ward off any nefarious activities that may compromise its integrity. Now it doesn't mean that if folks still have plans, ways of getting around those uh, mechanisms, we should not look into it and we should not um, um, address it. And I just hope that whatever it is um, the appropriate authorities would look at it between now and when uh, election day uh, comes. All right. Gentlemen, we are so grateful for your time. Thank you for um, 
walking with us through this conversation, uh, Dr. John Osai Kwapong is a CDD fellow. Dr. Kwesi Amache Boateng is a political scientist at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Thank you.